morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids. There he is. <laughs> and welcome to season four and episode number 457, I believe it is, of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. do 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 Yeah. Just here. Day, recording day, is Wednesday, August um, 28th, it is, and it is an extremely gray day here where we are, uh, which why I am s- explains why I am so dark, even though all the lights are on, because uh, the light coming in from the window is pretty much non-existent uh, today. It's, it's, it's like when I say gray, it's not that light gray, it's actually like a dark gray. Gray. Not completely foreboding, like it looks like tornadoes are coming, but it, it it's dark. Yeah, not pleasant out. <laughs> nope, it is not a happy, sunshiny day here. No. Um, yes, I am your host, the Eager Beaver, pronounce he, him, hey, he, Mr. Beaver, hey, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Carved Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. I um, might have uh, an interesting show for you today, uh, kids and cubs. But before we uh, move on with this and the news, Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today, sir? Uh, yeah, uh, another sleepless night, so you know, oh. I'm not fully awake yet. Um, I think I'm okay, I think. Uh, you know, yeah. I, 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 I'm not entirely sure. I'm trying to get one of my... Oh, there's there's the problem. One of my camera wouldn't work because I had the the lens covered for some reason. I'm just trying to get this thing in here. You'll see her in a sec. I'll just put her on the screen. Um, uh, she, she, well, can't really tell in that photo. I know. Let's go to this one. <laughs> there we go. She's kind of zonked out in the studio here at my feet. Um, and, and I think uh, her sort of attitude this morning is indicative of the kind of day we're going to have. She woke up a few minutes after six, after the alarm went off, stretched, walked into the kitchen, walked back in, crawled into bed with me, fell back to sleep. I got out of bed at 6.30 to start this because I needed a little bit extra this morning. And she's sleeping in the studio. I haven't taken her out yet. She had a bite to eat and then immediately went and threw up. (laughs) Oh, no. Well, it was the food she ate. It wasn't even digested. She so she felt a little bad about that, but I cleaned it up. She's okay. So I'll take her out after this. So yeah. How, how my mental health is right now. I can, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a cloudy gray day, but it's supposed to be relatively uh, nice over the next couple of days, as I understand it. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Today is the high today is expected to be 21. Yeah. So okay. you know, it's temperate. That- that's better, no, because like I think last week or the week before we had some days that were like 
12 and 14. Yeah, yeah. And then we're looking at 22 Thursday, 26 Friday, 25 Saturday, 25 Sunday, yeah. 20 on Monday. And yesterday, I'm not sure what the temperature was, but holy crap, whatever it was, it was hot. It was, uh, it was 27, 35 with the Humidex, I think. It was pretty hot yesterday. The yeah. sun was searing. Oh, yeah, it was. I went yeah, it was some errands and that I was, again, I do come with some defense. And yeah. after 45 seconds, it's like, damn, I'm feeling this. It was not, uh, not, not comfortable at all. No kidding. All right. Kids and cups. Oh, oh, by the way, uh, I'm doing really well. I think I'm not like totally over, but way more over um, just the exhaustion. Oh, uh, yeah. While I still did sleep yesterday, it was nowhere near as much like the like, no constant narcolepsy like it's been the That's past good. days. Uh, and uh, I got to have a because we're both still in town, um, James and I had uh, some a dinner last night, which was oh, okay. nice. Cool. So we had some one-on-one -on -one time as well uh, at uh, Johnny Farina's, and uh, um, I ate too much. <laughs> Paying for it today, are you? Uh, more last night. Fortunately, dear, we we met a little earlier, so dinner was or the uh, dinner was done a little earlier, so I did have time to uh, digest the entire elephant i ate before going to sleep <laughs> well, i mean i think i'm still recovering from sunday evening's dinner we we ate a lot of we ate a lot uh, of steak yeah and see and sunday i felt absolutely fine but yesterday it was like you know like when a snake eats like a guinea pig and you see like the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what i felt like <laughs> i understand didn't I look really like do it. understand. Thank, thank you, but I felt like it. it was like, ooh, this is going to take a minute to go down. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, wonderful time, and uh, I think uh, we're both heading uh, out today. Yesterday, I was uh, I was planning to go back home, uh, but yeah, that's what I thought. It, well, it, it was Canada Day at the U.S. Open with five Canadians playing, right, and. I do like my tennis, and um, when I go home, well, of course, well, not only when I go home, but I do like my beaver sweetie, and my beaver sweetie is very talkative and very smart and very charming, so therefore very interesting to talk to. And, you know, between being all that charming and smart, he also throws in some sweet nothings, which always, you know, make me want to listen more. Of so, course, of course. <laughs> so uh, I don't get to watch a lot of tennis if I'm there because, well, yeah, the, no, the, I get it. I get it. Very it's intriguing to watch at home. competition. Um, now, it turns out it wasn't a great investment of my time because Canada Day at the U.S. Open was also Carnage Day at the U.S. Open. Uh, all five of our players were up in singles. Uh, Felix Ogiel Yassim uh, wasn't up to snuff and was playing against uh, some guy, this new 18 year old guy on the scene, uh, well, at least at this level, uh, who has a wickedly fast serve and uh, was missing nothing yesterday. Oh. Uh, so, a guy named Mensik or something, but uh, keep your eye on him if you're just a tennis fan, not just like Canadian tennis, but tennis fan, because uh, holy crap. Um, he, he was a freight train, unstoppable. Uh, Shapovalov did have some chances, and uh, but was not able to uh, get past uh, Van der Zanschlup from the Netherlands. And then um, Leila Annie Fernandez uh, did have some chances against Potapova, uh, but uh, was not able to see it through. And then Bianca Andrescu last night uh, was playing. Jasmine Paolini, who's like number five in the world and has been having the season of her life. I mean, she uh, mm -hmm. was a finalist at Wimbledon, a finalist at the French Open, and won the gold medal in doubles in Paris. Uh, so she's kind of hot right now. Can I make a, a social commentary here? I just want to make a social commentary here. And it's it's a anecdotal observation on my part. I find that the folks who usually cheer the loudest for Team Canada Oftentimes, uh, uh, amongst those folks are the ones who are anti-immigrant, yet 
Look at who our best tennis players are. The product mm -hmm. of immigration. Ozhi Eliasim has roots to Togo, Shapovala, Russian name, but uh, Israeli Russian. Uh, Andrescu from Romania, Leila Annie Fernandez. Uh, I do not, I don't know where actually. I don't know whose part. Uh, I want to say Ecuador, but it could be incorrect. Yeah. I mean, all, the, all these children grew up here, but all their parents emigrated here. Yeah. Yeah, and then Gabriel Diallo, who uh, I do not know uh, where from yet, but uh, um, browner than me. Well, <laughs> and, and here's the thing. You know, I'm going to I'm going to harken back to uh, 1988 for this. I'm I'm going on a bit of a social commentary this morning. It's it's you know when when Ben Johnson went to Seoul, he went there as a Canadian. He won as a Canadian when they stripped him of his medal for his urine sample that was obviously tampered with because he wasn't on stenazolol at the time. Mm -hmm. um, he came home a Jamaican and then those, you know, <laughs> I'll never forget that. I, I'll never forget when he said that. And I thought, yeah, we failed him. We failed him in every way, shape and form. And again, like I said, the same folks who will scream the loudest for team Canada will scream louder against immigration. Yet most of team Canada happens to be the product of immigration. Mm hmm. Do they yep. not see the, no, they don't see the irony there, do they? Irony is lost on those folks. Yes. So, uh, but the one winner yesterday in singles, Gabriel Diallo, the young mm. man who I told you to keep your eye on because he might be, well, no, maybe he is going somewhere. Uh, so I think he is ranked 143rd in the world and is currently playing like he's top 64 in the world because the draw starts at 128. If you win one, you're one of the 64 best. And only his second ever Grand Slam. So uh, good for him. Uh, so uh, we'll be following him in singles, but our attention now shifts to doubles <laughs> because the rest of our singles players are out. Uh, interestingly enough, Gabriela Dabrowski is ranked number one in women's doubles along with her partner, Aaron Rutliff, um, mm -hmm. who uh, plays for New Zealand but does have ties to Canada. And interestingly enough, uh, her sister whose first name I cannot remember now off the top of my head, is competing for Team Canada at the Paralympics. So there you go. Uh, we have one of the Routliff sisters competing for New Zealand in tennis and the other one uh, competing for Canada at the Paralympics. And I wish I remembered before. I just heard that in passing and I forgot to note it down. Um, and then uh, she is also ranked number one in mixed doubles. Uh, where she'll be playing with uh, Joe Salisbury from uh, the UK, who uh, has, uh, I, I believe, a few uh, Grand Slams under his belt as well uh, as a male's doubles player, and even maybe a couple of the mixed doubles as well. Um, Canada, again, uh, gets hit with like the most terrible draw possible, uh, which was the case for singles and here again in doubles, because Leila Fernandez, who is uh, top 35 uh, player in doubles in the first round is playing against Gabriela Dabrowski and Aaron Rout left the number one seeds. Mm. So Canada against Canada in the first round. And there are only two Canadians playing in women's doubles. Yeah. <laughs> so again, uh, the draw could not be any more cruel <laughs> for us. Um, but hey, that again, tennis gods, that's the way it happens, right? Uh, it's a, it, it can be equally good and equally bad uh, for everyone. I remember when uh, Dennis Shapovalov and Felix Ogiele Sim were just getting to the Grand Slam level, I think, tw twice in a row at the U.S. Open. They, go, they got each other in the first round. Like, come on! <laughs> so, uh, but hey, uh, there will be some good tennis for the rest of the week. And you know what? Uh, even though there won't be as many Canadians to watch playing tennis at the U.S. Open, I guess that will free up my time. Well, I mean, you're still going to watch the U.S. Open because you still want to see players play. I mean, even if yes. they're not Canadian, you still want to see the matches. Yeah. Yes, yes. But uh, there is Paralympic tennis. Yeah, which starts, uh, does it kick off tonight? Uh, the opening ceremonies kick off today. Competition yes. starts tomorrow. I don't think that I uh, I didn't check the schedule as closely as I should have, but I know that for the Olympics there was some competition that started before the opening ceremonies at 
does not seem to be from what I gather mm -hmm. for the Paralympics to be the case, but I didn't actually go on the Paralympic website and actually look at the schedule, but I've seen nothing in the, in the press or anything that seems to indicate and what the little bit that I did see on the web yesterday when I was uh, telling you what to look for on to, in terms of Thursday, what were the first sports up mm -hmm. uh, in competition, there was nothing that was indicating uh, matches before sometime on Thursday. So I think for the Paralympics, uh, the opening ceremonies are its own thing on its own day and then competition starts. Um, so the opening ceremonies, if anybody does want to watch them, they are at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, they will be all over, of course, CBC, the main network, um, GEM, of course, uh, and all that good stuff. I'm just trying to draw. I'll be showing you absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. I think there's going to be about like 2,000 hours uh, of programming, uh, all things combined, on uh, CBC Gem. And uh, about 140 hours uh, on on network. Mm -hmm. so, Which is quite a bit, uh, actually. That's, well, I think bit. given network coverage is almost equivalent to what it was for the... Uh, for the uh recent olympics correct me if i'm wrong uh yeah, close that, it's not it's not perfect but it's close i think yeah I could be wrong. Closer, but not uh because the the ones for uh the olympics themselves uh there was basically 20 hours a day of on-air programming oh, okay. uh, along with yeah. prime times and the repeats and whatnot uh that's not going to happen for this there will be uh but there will be three times a day uh, well, there will be some programming uh, on the air, uh, according to CBC. Um, but I will uh, see what else that they've got here uh, on here. They say that uh, the Olympics officially begin Wednesday with another opening ceremony featuring around 4,400 athletes from 182 delegations. There will be no boats this time, right? Paralympics. Right. You want to make sure that uh, people can participate. But the athletes will get to experience their own open air parade of nations as they march along the Champs Elysees from the Arc de Triomphe to the Place de la Concorde. There, in front of some 65,000 spectators, they'll take in a show also directed by Thomas Joly. Uh, so, the guy that did the opening ceremonies and the closing ceremonies for the, uh, for the Olympics has also take, taken on the contract for the Paralympics. So that's uh, pretty interesting that he that he uh, he chose to do both as well. Um, let's see what else. The Canadian flag bearers were announced, and they will be uh, longtime Paralympians. Uh, Pat Anderson, who uh, Devin Haru talked to us about on our show when we interviewed him before he left, calling him essentially the Michael Jordan of wheelchair basketball. Uh, he will be uh, participating in his sixth Paralympics. And the other one is Katerina Roxon, uh, who is a swimmer and will be participating in her fifth Paralympics. Uh, so they will be the flag bearers. Um, let's see. Uh, Anderson helped Canada win gold in 2000, 2004, and 2012 when he scored 34 points to beat Australia in the final. He alone mm -hmm. yes. scored 34 points. Well, not alone, but with the help of his team. But 34 points. Uh, Team, Canada, Team Canada basketball is not considered a favorite uh, this time around. Um, they uh, had to go through the longest route possible uh, to be able to qualify uh, to get in. Uh, the Paralympics also apparently, uh, according to Anderson, cut down the number of teams from 12 to 8 uh, this time around. So uh, it was harder to qualify, which is maybe why it took longer. But it also means that uh, you might have, uh, well, you will have fewer games to sort of reach your peak mm -hmm. once the competition starts. So, so I've got uh, some uh, got some interesting information here about the Paralympics in case uh, those of us who didn't know, and I was one of them up until just a few moments ago. Paralympic history began in 1948 at a hospital for war veterans in Stoke Mandeville, located 60 kilometers north of London. German neurologist Sir Ludwig, 
Sir Ludwig Gutmann, was looking for a way to help his paraplegic patients, all World War II veterans, rehabilitate more quickly. He speci- his specialized unit was made up of Royal Air Force pilots with spinal cord injuries who all needed to use wheelchairs. Dr. Gutmann organized sporting events as the Olympic Games took place in London. So the very first uh, Paralympic competition, mm-hmm. but it was the ninth International Stoke Mandeville Games in 1960, considered to be the first Paralympic Games, take place from the 18th to the 25th of September in Rome, six days after the closing ceremony of the Olympic Games. 5,000 people attended the opening ceremony at the Aqua Astosa Stadium. 23 nations take part, sending 400 athletes all in wheelchairs who compete in eight sports, para-athletics, wheelchair basketball, para-swimming, para-table tennis, para-archery, snooker, darchery, a combination of darts and archery, and wheelchair fencing. It wasn't until 1988 when, uh, for the first time in history, the Paralympic Games are held at the same site as the Olympic Games in Seoul, the Republic of Korea. Competition takes place two weeks after the Olympic closing ceremony, 15th to the 24th of October, with 3,057 athletes from 60 countries participating. Several Olympic officials are recruited and specially trained in Paralympic competitions to carry out their roles at both games. French Paralympian uh, Mustafa Badid steals the headlines after winning gold in the men's 200, 1500, and 5,000-meter and marathon wheelchair racing events, as well as finishing first in the 1500-meter demonstration event, demonstration event featured at the Olympic Games. Dennis Oler of the USA makes Paralympic history in Seoul by becoming the first leg amputee to run 100 meters in under 12 seconds. The American claimed gold with a time of 11.73 seconds. I don't think I can run 100 meters in under 12 seconds. He did it on one leg. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's 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 uh, since '88, it's played at the same site, and usually two weeks uh, after the games. Mm-hmm. It was kind of cool. I was just reading up on it because there was there's not a lot about it that I like. I I, I need to be more aware of these things, right? Mm-hmm. It's hard to keep track sometimes. Yeah, and so when uh, they have uh, you know for the Olympics, they have the Olympic torch. Well, they have the Paralympic torch. This, the Olympic torch always starts in Greece, but the Paralympic torch starts in London because the first, uh, that's the, the, the origins, as you were mentioning, uh, Mr. Grizzly, when you started off that segment. Mm-hmm. Uh, it starts from there. Um, so, uh, uh, PNC Bio's comment here, he says, I, uh, it won't feel parallel if there aren't a few contro- controversies. Let me try that again. It won't feel parallel if there aren't a few controversies over how satanic the opening ceremony are and at least one big international transvestigation. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Speaking of the opening ceremonies, the lady who was um, the the DJ in the festivity tableau based on painting the Feast of the Gods yes, by a Dutch painter that's in the Dijon Museum in France for those who still haven't yet gotten the memo. Um, People choose to uh, believe what they want to, even though when you give them the facts and the truth, they still will believe what they want to, unfortunately. She was selected as one of the the torchbearers uh, for the Paralympic claim, and she said that she was very, very honored to do it. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Just, just, just for a note for uh, for a couple of people watching across all platforms right now. The current live viewership is four twenty. Oh, it just jumped up to four thirty three. So it was four twenty for a minute. So I guess you could celebrate if that's your thing. Ah, <laughs> cool, cool. Um, so our second flag bearer. Uh, Katerina Roxon's 31. She's competing in her fifth Paralympic Games, as I mentioned. Uh, she won an individual gold medal in 2016 in Rio and then added a relay bronze three years later in uh, Tokyo. Competition will start Thursday. So, yeah, there we go. And uh, runs for 11 days through September 8th. There will be a total of 549 events in 22 different para sports, including swimming, track and field, cycling, wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby, wheelchair tennis wheelchair fencing, sitting volleyball, triathlon, canoe, rowing, equestrian, judo, goalball, and boccia. Canada sent 126 athletes to compete. Um, So there you go. Uh, 39 Canadians are making their Paralympic debut. 10 of uh, members of Team Canada have already won a Paralympic gold medal in other uh, Paralympic Games. Uh, and 12 are multi-medalists, uh, names that you will be wanting to look out for and that you probably will be hearing are Aurélie Rival, Katerina Roxon, of course, Danielle Doris in swimming, 
Nate Reach, Greg Stewart, and Brent Lakatos in track and field. Um, Pat Anderson, Bo Hedges, Chad Jasmine, and Tyler Miller in wheelchair basketball. Uh, Aurélie Rivard has five career goals, including a pair in 2021 in Tokyo when Canada finished with five gold and 21 medals total. Um, the oldest Paralympian is a wheelchair fencer named Ruth Sylvie Morel, who will turn 68. Never too old. And the youngest will be rookie swimmer Reed Maxwell, who will uh, be turning 17. Uh, live coverage starts at 1.30 p.m. today with the opening ceremony. Um, starting Thursday, uh, each broadcasts and streaming platforms will bring you competition via three daily live shows. So the Petro Canada Paris Prime, hosted by Scott Russell. So he, did, I thought he, I, I, I had the impression that after the Olympics he was leaving because they did the goodbye sign off, because it's his last one before he's mm. retired. But he's doing the Paralympics as well, so that that actually comes to me as a surprise. I thought he was, uh, he was gone after the Olympics, but he's staying for both as well. Um, so good. Uh, so those will be happening at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. So there'll be nothing in the morning. Uh, if you're Eastern time, uh, and then you have, you know, you calculate uh, throughout the country. So maybe uh, depending on other areas, I think if you're in BC, there, you know, 11 a.m., there'll be some morning stuff. Uh, but uh, there won't be any uh, things starting at uh, uh, 8 a.m. or 7 a.m. Canadian time uh, to watch there. So 2 p.m. and then Toyota Paralympic Games primetime hosted by Russell and Steph Reed at 8 p.m. Uh, in your local time zone. And then Canadian Tire Paralympics tonight, hosted by Devin Haru and Rosaline Fillion, uh, the diver. So uh, Devin Haru is not only going to be doing a comp commentary track side, he's actually hosting one of the shows. Way to go. I'm so happy for him. And that will be at 11.30 p.m. local. So 2 p.m., 8 p.m., and 11.30 p.m. Uh, so, uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. The 2 PM is Eastern time. And then you have to calculate. And then the 8 and the 11 PM will be at your local time, no matter the time zone. There you go. Uh, digital coverage will also include daily episodes of rise and stream highlighting the must see events and Canadians to follow and hot takes featuring interviews with athletes and analysts. Both shows will be available on the Paris 2024 site and on sports YouTube channel. Facebook, Instagram, and X, and uh, I'm guessing that uh, the rest of the stuff will be uh, on Gem as well. So there you go. That should be all your information uh, to cover it. If you are, are also looking to find out more if, uh, about the sports and how the classes work, if you do a search uh, about that um, Paralympics uh, classes, how they work, uh, the Associated Press put out a good article on that, uh, I think, yesterday. Uh, so if you want to understand more how the classes work uh, to get uh, more enjoyment out of the games or understand what's going on, because sometimes, for example, like in swimming, um, you all have people in different classes swimming in the pool at the same time because it's a time event. Um, so sometimes it looks like the person who did win uh, maybe didn't win. And mm -hmm. because they're not competing, they're not all swimming in the same the, the same type of race, even though they're swimming at the same time. So, uh, and so that will help you understand how, how that works with the classes and that kind of stuff. So, I'm very, very, very excited about this. I'm very excited about this. Uh, I said that uh, you know, equal they will be getting equal pay as well for their medals as uh, Olympians. Uh, so I uh, can't wait to, uh, to mm. see the, the joy on the faces uh, for, the, the, for everyone who's participating, but particularly for the medalists, because you know, when they'll be going to that uh, circle for doing, uh, doing those interviews with CBC, um, they know that they, they will be having uh, some financial reward as well as glory. So, uh, welcome to the big time, kids. Long overdue. Yes, yes. Make us proud. Listen, 
we know you're going to make us proud. So go so, kick them. We're going to so share a few know. things with you here quickly as we, we change tack and, and move on to some stories. But I just wanted to share something with you that I showed Mr. Beaver just before we started this morning. And I will read this to you. And I'd, I'm going to give this sort of as an audition to advertise for them, if you will. <laughs> this is uh, Red Eye Louis Life Blended. With Red Eye Louis Vodkila, you never have to choose, never have to compromise. It's the perfect blend of smooth vodka for your refined side, combined with, combined with just the right amount of tequila naughtiness to fuel your wild side. Next time you're ready to mix it up, party with vodkila. Live life blended. I, I uh, have never been more excited and terrified to try a beverage in my life. <laughs> vodkila. Vodkila. It sounds like it sounds like, you know that game we used to, you might have played back in the day where um, you get a shot glass and then like mix stuff up that you find in your fridge, like sriracha and mayonnaise and like that juice from the lemon thingy that you squeeze and then somebody drinks, like, is blindfolded and has to drink it. Yeah. Sounds like somebody did that but with alcohol. Because <laughs> that, that's either a really, 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 really good time waiting to happen or the worst hangover you could possibly imagine. And like you, um, uh, well, I think I'm, I, I'm less prone to alcohol, but I am, um, I am intrigued. I have to say, I'm intrigued. I'm wondering what will happen <laughs> if I had a few of those. <laughs> well, speaking of alcohol, I thought I'd give you this one from yesterday. This was on the 6 o'clock news last night. Here's a little clip from CTV News Ottawa. This quickie on Elgin Street, also among the more than 170 convenience stores and gas stations across Ottawa that will be able to sell alcohol as part of the Ontario government's plan to expand where it's sold. But I just don't think they're implementing it in the correct manner. But again, at the same token, I like the convenience of it. I'm not going to lie. Yep. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Yeah, when I was out walking Lola, she was uh, standing there and says, could I ask you a few questions about how you feel about beer and wine being sold here at the corner store? I said, sure. I talked to her for about three or four minutes. They used like eight seconds of the clip, which is, you know, that's, that's how it's going to be. They're not podcasting. They're broadcasting. So they cut things up. Right, right. But she did took a, you know, a clip. I said, you know, and, and it's true. I don't think they're implementing it correctly. I think they're rolling it out too fast to too many stores. Um, it's costing us money to do it, but I do like the convenience of it. To say otherwise would be a lie, and I'm not a liar. I like the convenience of it. I do. Yeah. Oh, and yes, it is actually Tavi G. That is within 200 meters of a school and daycare. Hell. Oh yes. The yes, it is. Jack Purcell Community Center and Elgin Street Public School are directly behind that store. Less than 100 meters away. Yep. So a, a um, it's not a consumption site, but it is a sales site right next to a school. Funny how that works, eh? Uh-huh. Funny Indeed. how that works. Yes, uh, uh, and allegedly are teetotally premier. When it yes. comes down. Yes. But did you All see right. him, though he's advertising, right? Oh, yes. Advertising for uh, for this as of late. And and funny thing was, didn't he just uh, seriously uh, promote a uh, uh, promote things by um, going on uh, going on TV and slamming? Yes. Ready to drink. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. So the only gonna, thing he didn't do is like crush the can on his forehead. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let He's me just show you something here. I'm going to okay. share this. This I'll share this. This is a this is the map. This is a satellite map. So right here, see where that you can see the my arrow, my cursor. 
mm-hmm. circling. That's Bushi's. Well, formerly Bushi's. It's, it's Bushi Square. You can see Bushi Square right there. Um, and right next to that is the Quickie, which used to be Bushi's. This is the Jack Purcell Community Center. There's a daycare in there. And this is the Elgin Street Public School. <laughs> so how far is it from here to there? It ain't 200 meters, I'll tell you that right now. Not even close. How do I know that? Because it's 150 meters from my front door to the left on its pump. Mm. Yeah. And it's a, a lot further of a walk. Yes, so, yeah. Indeed. indeed, yeah. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah, this <laughs> is there are going to, something's going to happen at some point where this is going to blow up. Well, one of the things I did say to her, I said, "Look, I I like the convenience. I do. I think they've rolled it out. Uh, it's not being implemented correctly because they're doing it too quickly, too fast, and it's costing us too much money to do it." Also, along with the fact that there's going to be kids who are going to be stealing, you know, just to get a beer, there'll be people who will, who will lift. Are they going to be able to staff the store appropriately to sell it? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Look, I, it, at the same token, I go around the world, you can do this across the river, five minutes from here. They've been doing it for decades. They're just rolling it out too quickly. That's mm-hmm. my take. They're, they're doing it too fast. I like the convenience of it, but it's going to create issues for, for, uh, there's going to be beer cans everywhere. They're just doing it too quickly. Yep. It, it, it's what he did to, to, to counter, um, the, the wind government's rollout of the cannabis retail stores. I don't think they were, I thought, okay, I, I like what the idea of let's roll it out slowly. We'll do it in different markets. We'll do it bit by bit. They were going to start the whole province with, I think 16 stores. So that's yeah. one store per million. I'm like, Okay, that's not nearly enough. That's yes. too slow of a rollout. Yes. And Doug just said, no, anybody can roll it out. You're not just government run. I'm like, okay, now there's one every three feet. Yeah. There are something like 15 of them within a 1.5 kilometer radius of my apartment. Yep. Now I can get beer at, there's an LCBO next to the Loblaws. There used to be beer and wine in the Loblaws. They don't have it anymore. I think it's because they're actually in the same building. They're separated by a wall. Mm. The farm boy used to have beer and wine. There is a wine store at the farm boy. They used to have beer at the farm boy. And then because the liquor store moved from the World Exchange Plaza to 160 Elgin, they said, well, no, you were too close. You, you can't sell. And I'm like, well, hang on a second here. Hang on a second here. You were selling beer and then they moved. Don't you have a grandfathered clause in that? St- I'm just... You know, I'm looking at the, again, the complications of it all, but, but like, let's be fair about this. Anyway, I, I don't know how to roll out. It starts next week. It's going to be curious. I do like the idea of the convenience because a lot of times when I'm, I, I need to go somewhere and grab a couple of beer to show up for a party or something, I don't necessarily have the time to run all the way up to the beer at the liquor store. And if it's Wednesday after six o'clock, the liquor store's closed. So then I have to go to the other one, which is South. And that's a bit more of a jog to get to. So the convenience mm-hmm. walk, literally walking past the store on my way to where I'm going. I like yeah. that convenience to say otherwise would be a lie and I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I just think they're rolling about, rolling it out in, in a, in a haphazard rushed manner and they've licensed too many places. Yeah. And now, you know, in seven elevens, which we don't have in Ottawa, you can stay and dine and, <laughs> What, what what pairs well with weak old hot roller hot dogs, right? <laughs> like, <I mean. laughs> Definitely not Beaujolais Nouveau. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, other things uh, that are going on, uh, Kits and Cubs, uh, I saw that you, you put uh, in the description something about Coots, so uh, let's go there. Yeah, well, uh, so... so the, the, the two gentlemen in, in question that Anthony Oleniak and Chris Carbrook were found not guilty of conspiring to murder police at the blockade. It did find the pair guilty of mischief and possession, possessing a weapon for dangerous purpose. Uh, Oleniak was also found guilty of possessing a pipe bomb. Now here's where it gets interesting. He says, the, um, uh, the men uh, said that, that, that they, they were keeping these weapons for hunting, but this is, uh, 
Mr. Carbett demonstrated then as now that he is prepared to lie under oath when it suits him to do so. I conclude that Mr. Carbett, like Mr. Eleniak, was prepared to engage in a firefight with police. This was an exceedingly dangerous situation. And this is, uh, Lebrenz is the judge in this case. The judge says he also accepted as true Eleniak's comments to female undercover Mounties in which he said he viewed the blockade as a war, that weapons were needed for credibility, and that he would like to slit Mountie throats. Eleniak's lawyer, Marilyn Burns, suggested the evidence was tainted because the undercover officers flirted with Eleniak to elicit information. Burns pointed to heart emojis, heart emojis on some text between Eleniak and an officer. LeBrun said heart emojis are often used to agree with something someone has written. I find no basis to conclude that the operators use romance or any other such distasteful connectivity to induce conversations. I am also not clear how it would induce anybody to say what they said. I simply find that suggestion to be offensive. And that is from the judge. And I'm like, well, yeah, I love you. By the way, I want to, I want to slit the throats of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. So that's uh, for Kids and Cubs. Um, that's uh, because uh, we mentioned on the show the, the thing with Coots. Two had ple pleaded guilty before and two went all the way through. Uh, they were not found guilty of a conspiracy and we couldn't figure out how exactly that was the case, but there we go. Uh, but sentencing has started. So this is from the sentencing hearing and uh, Justice David Lebrenz uh, was the one that... Uh, is coming to the conclusion that uh, even though you weren't found guilty of a conspiracy, the evidence shows that uh, you were definitely ready for a food outfit to use uh, whatever weapons you had to kill. So there's, I guess there's a difference with regard to actual conspiracy and, you know, being well and just being ready to use violence. Uh, but that's where uh, this court comes from. The judge told the court that he accepts the verdicts as proof that the jury believed both men brought weapons, ammunition, and body armor to the two-week standoff, not just to show off or hunt animals, but for a far more sinister purpose. Quote, it was to support the blockade and to engage in a war with police if it came to that eventually, said the judge. The abundance of live ammunition, the medical kit, the ballistic vests are not supportive of showing off firearms or hunting coyotes. They are supportive of a war with police. So, um, yes, the something kissing hearing is going to continue uh, on Thursday. Um, and, yeah, I think that's pretty much the, the most that we have about that at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more to come, obviously. We'll we'll hear yeah. more tomorrow, but yeah, I be I believe originally they were saying that they were expecting the sentencing hearings to end on the 29th, which would be tomorrow, uh, and then uh, then the judge usually takes some time to, to think and consider and ponder before they come back with the sentence. So I don't know exactly when one will be delivered, but uh, yeah, uh, judge not impressed, no, and not buying the story. Well, I mean. Why would he buy it? <laughs> like, come on. But but we see that that goes to explain, like you said, like we couldn't understand how it was that they couldn't be found guilty of conspiracy. So conspiracy must be something else completely. But the pipe bomb and whatnot and what they were there for is still seeming to be interpreted by the judge as being uh, severe enough to be mm -hmm. quite aggravating, uh, aggravating factors when uh, considering sentencing. So. Uh, you know, good stuff. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, now, for the because uh, these two spent a lot of time in custody because there was a long pretrial. Um, once the sentence comes down, uh, they'll probably um, have be sentenced to time served because I believe before you are found guilty, your time served counts like for two day two to one on days or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so they will. They probably will have already served their time because I think they were in custody for at least 800 days, maybe even a thousand before things started. So, you know, if thousands, three years, if they're given, you know, if they're given five and it's counted two to one, then they've, they've already served it while waiting for trial. I apologize if I'm reading something you already read because I was 
going over a few other things at the same time and may have missed this, but this is from the judge. He says, I conclude that Mr. Carbera and Mr. Aloniak were prepared to engage in a firefight with police. This was an exceedingly dangerous situation. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. So the, the judge is convinced. Oh yeah. All right. They're, they're going to, they're going to be going away for a little while. Mm -hmm. Let's stick um, with Alberta for a minute. Did you understand? Did you know this about Calgary? Their water use outpaces cap on first full day of new restrictions. Oh, Cal nope. Calgarians sent 530 million liters down the drain on the first full day of the new round of rationing. That's well above the 450 meter, 450 million liter cap the city needs to stay under while a troubled, troubled water main goes under repair. Yeah. So the water main that broke just before the uh, stampede took place, uh, says the, the, the pipe burst in June, forcing the city to ban outdoor watering and ask residents to cut their indoor uh, use by a quarter. Those hmm. measures had mostly eased when earlier this month, Mayor Gioti Gondek announced more weak spots had been found on the pipe and urgent repairs would be needed to avoid another catastrophic break. Hmm. Gondek says the city will be in a lot of trouble if residents don't do more to cut their water use, stop using sprinklers and hoses, keep showers under three minutes, reduce toilet flushes, and run dishwashers less, off, less often. I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. So let me see if I get this correct. This is supposed to last 100 years. It didn't even make it to 50. Mm -hmm. And we're just supposed to accept that. It's like, yeah, what did they do? We saved a few bucks. Oh, but what's it costing now? Because yep. 50 years later on a water main that was supposed to last 100 years, the infrastructure around you has been built up. There are more people, 50 years ago, what was the population of Calgary 50 years ago compared to today? In 1988, when it hosted the Olympics, I think it was about 300,000. It's 1.6 million today. Mm -hmm. What was it 50 years ago? Mm -hmm. So now that the water main is, is, is undergoing a lot more usage because there's more people there, they obviously have tried to cut corners and save a few bucks to show a surplus, which cities aren't supposed to either go into the red or into the black. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to break even each year. Yes. So there's a whole bunch of crap going on when it comes to infrastructure spending and investments in the city mm -hmm. of Calgary. And I've no doubt other cities across the country because didn't the same thing happen in Quebec City recently? Uh, in Montreal, there was the water main. There they're doing tests and analysis because they're wondering if it might be the type of salt that they use the winter that uh, degraded uh, the pipes that should have lasted also, I think, I think like for a hundred years or whatnot and didn't make it anywhere near that. Uh, for the Calgary thing, I believe there was a situation about there uh, in the production of certain pipes in a certain period of years, there having been a defect in the manufacturing of them. And those are the ones that uh, Calgary may have gotten uh, when it comes to that. Um, but I don't know if that was confirmed either, but uh, that was a, uh, that was an avenue that was being explored at one point early on. Um, all right, um, talking a little bit, a uh, little bit tidbit that I picked up about uh, what's going on in Ontario with regard to the closure of the overdose consumption sites or safe consumption sites. Uh, overdose prevention sites or uh, safe consumption sites, depending on how you want to call them. Uh, you know, we were wondering how it is that those sites were put near schools and daycares because I would have figured that there were restrictions with regard to that prior to the approvals because I remembered back in the day when um, they were licensing marijuana for medical use that if you were somebody that was applying for that license um if you lived within a certain distance of a school or a daycare you couldn't get that license to possess right. under compassionate grounds so i figured that if that was the case just for regular citizens to be able to possess marijuana in their home which had to be kept in a safe or something or under lock and key somehow like a filing cabinet with a lock and key then surely for a supervised uh drug consumption site there would have been that type of stuff and it seems that that is 
not necessarily the case. Uh, there have been talking to some people that run some of the sites. And um, I think there's one in Thunder Bay uh, that is uh, losing its uh, license. Uh, and then there might be another one um, in another area that uh, that's not affected by the most recent ban, but they're, they just don't have the funding to operate. Um, but one of them said they were approved in 2018 to do that, which would be under Doug Ford. Right. And the schools and whatnot were there then. So a lot of these sites that right now he's going in front of the cameras and saying they're the worst thing that could possibly ever happen to a community are ones he himself approved knowing full well they were close to mm -hmm. he himself he wasn't sitting there in the room but you know his minister or whatever like but but they were close to those things when they were approved and he had no problem with them then he only has problems with them now uh, about um oh i don't know the seven weeks or so before he's going to call a snap election hmm. yeah yeah just things that make you go hmm. Hmm. yeah yeah but uh how did these I things get you. there i can't believe that they're well, yeah. Well, now you know how they got there. Mm -hmm. He put them there. So there you go. Um, we also mentioned, because we're getting uh, going back to school, and we talked about COVID cases and, and that type of stuff, and uh, I was looking for some more information about what was going on in Canada. Uh, there was a wonderful uh, interview with Dr. Iris Scorfinkel on uh, CBC the other day, and uh, she had all the information. So uh, I, I'm basically quoting her here uh, with the information that I'm going to be uh, sharing with you. Uh, last week in preparation uh, for the upcoming season, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States approved Pfizer and Moderna's newest vaccines. Health Canada is now reviewing the updated vaccines and is expected to follow suit. Um, Iris Gonfinkel is a family physician and clinical researcher. Uh, she says that uh, both of those vaccines are approved in the United States for everyone six months of age and over. The latest update in these vaccines still use mRNA to teach the body how to make the spike protein, and that will trigger the body to make antibodies to have at the ready to lower how severe future COVID infections will be. Um, usually, uh, the companies uh, start delivering the vaccines almost immediately to pharmacies, hospitals, and clinics. Uh, but before they get the permission to do that, they have to compare the antibody response that their latest vaccine induced in mice to their previous XBB vaccine. Typically, Health Canada approves these vaccines within a week or two of the U.S. having done it. Uh, this one seems like it might be a little longer because they are new formulations based on new variants because they're talking about an approval at the, by early fall. And if we're looking at fall based on the actual like season date, like September 21st, 22nd, that sort of area rather than the 1st of September being the fall, uh, we're still uh, yeah, you know, a, a solid uh, three weeks away rather than just two, uh, if not three to four. Um, so that uh, might have a, the fact that they are, they are new formulations might have something to do with that. Uh, in Canada as well, uh, when uh, they are approved, basically the federal government supplies them free to the provinces and territories at no, uh, so no cost to them, but it is up to the provinces and territories to pick up the cost for distributing them and getting them into the arms. Um, What's on offer right right now it targets Omicron's XBB subvariant, uh, but XBB is not what's causing the COVID-19 infections in Canada right now. Right now, it's KP2 and KP3. And at the time that the vaccines were formulated, it was more KP2, but KP3 is now uh, out competing KP2. 
Either way, she says uh, Pfizer or Moderna's latest vaccines will be expected to prevent both of the subvariants, KP2 or KP3, because they're genetically near identical. Um, she says that the new Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are seven to eight times more effective than having the body produce the antibodies to KP2. Uh, then, sorry, their vaccines are seven to eight times more effective than having the body produce the antibodies to KP2 than the XBB vaccines alone had been. So if you got your XBB the first time around, and let's say you didn't get your second booster in the spring because everybody said, well, you know, summer's coming and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we're outside and it's warmer and all that kind of stuff. And there'll be a new formulation in the fall. So wait for that one, which was the nasty advice, unless you were in those uh, groups, like the people who are 16 over and people are you, immune. You, you got to pronounce that word nasty and ACI because it sounds nasty. too similar to something else. And I want to make sure everybody understood what you're saying. Nasty, 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 nasty. Committee on immunizations. Um, but uh, so, yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, other than them having given the, uh, the the recommendation to the groups that are the highest risk to get it as well in July, for the rest of us, they said that, you know, if we wanted to skip this one, we probably could. Um, but this one, they're, they're asking us not to skip. Um, when when now, uh, when is it available? Because I'm happy to get it. I just don't. I've not heard anything about a rollout or or well, that's right. thereof. Or. So that's what I was just explaining. So they've just been approved in the United States. Uh, now Health Canada usually takes that data, analyzes it, and that usually usually takes two weeks. This one uh, they're saying uh, early fall. So this one will probably take longer. Like saying my assumption is because they are new formulations for the K2 and K, KP2 and KP3 mm -hmm. and not XBB. So they're probably taking a little extra time uh, with it. But usually once Health Canada approves, they're immediately distributed and then it becomes the provinces that will roll them out. They usually roll them out to the target groups first and then later on. So uh, hopefully uh, by the time the uh, flu vaccine comes out, uh, in uh, October or something like that, that uh, they'll be ready for general public. Mm. Um, the rollouts, uh, the specific rollouts for specific groups uh, might also be getting shorter, just given that uh, the number of people who are taking them uh, is smaller than, you know, when right. two or three. So uh, they don't have to have the rollout uh, lasting as long. Uh, even if though, even if it might be in phase in phases, each phase might not have to be as long as it was uh, when we were getting our first shots. Mm -hmm. um, well, for the uh, record, Trent, just want to let you know uh, I've had half that amount, six, uh, and that was what was recommend, recommended to me by, by my physician. So I will continue to get them as per recommendation because four years on, never had COVID. Yeah. Now, people are wondering also about Novavax uh, because that vaccine is uh, does the same thing, uh, you know, helps you fight it off, but it's not based on mRNA technology. So there were some people, it's not that they were anti-vaccine. It's just that, well, I'm not sure that mRNA is proven technology. So once you design one that delivers it through, you know, the usual method that we're used to with vaccines, uh, you know, taking a portion, a portion of the virus and using it rather than programming your body to generate the spike protein yourself. Um, so Novavax is the one that was, that was used for doing that. Um, so with Novavax, it is the spike protein itself which's attached to a little booster to make sure that the body's immune response is optimal. Uh, the Novavax-sponsored research showed that theirs was up to 48 times more effective at protecting against KP variants than the XBB shot had been. Health Canada is actually reviewing the Novavax application. I saw something on Twitter uh, yesterday indicating that uh, it doesn't look like this version is going to meet the standards to be approved, but I, I haven't heard that from a Health Canada source and have not been able to verify that. Um, so uh, don't take that one to the bank yet. Uh, they are, they say, uh, there's usually... I need to address something here real quick. Uh, when it comes to MR, mRNA, uh, 
this is, is directly from uh, public health, jhu.edu. This is in 2021 when this article was released. Me messenger RNA or mRNA was discovered in the early 1960s. Research into how mRNA could be delivered into cells was developed in the 1970s. So why did it take so long until the COVID COVID global COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 for the first mRNA vaccine to be brought to market? Well, this article does explain it, and I will, I will put a, uh, a link in the chat for those who wish to read on it. But it is not new technology by any stretch of the imagination. It is mm -hmm. not. It's been around for a very long time. Right. They've been working on it and refining it and perfecting it. It says, a uh, big gap between the first mRNA flu vaccine was tested in mice in the 1990s and when the first mRNA vaccines for rabies were tested in humans in 2013. What was happening in interim? Well, they were, they were trying to perfect it and work on it. It's as simple as that. It's not new technology. This is mm -hmm. not, this is not uh, uh, something they just dreamt up in a lab one day. It's something they've been working on for decades. That's why when I say to people, it is safe. They've been testing it for a very long time, not just after COVID hit. COVID hit, government said, here's all the money you need. Get this to market as quickly as possible so we don't have, you know, mass death on our hands, which did occur anyway. But, you know, this saved millions of lives. Period. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so Novavax uh, may not be uh, the advice they have um, if you really wanted to take Novavax but you're not ready to take an mRNA vaccine is uh, to uh, remember that Paxlovid is still available uh, should you get an infection um, you know a lot of people are asking the question was like well why are they recommending Paxlovid instead of recommending one of the mRNA vaccines well I mean the, the most of the target market for Novavax would be people who don't yet trust mRNA, then telling them, well, you know, you still have mRNA. It's probably not going to be the best route <laughs> to, to let them know what they can do. Um, so uh, at that point, if they decide it's, you know, Novavax or, or nothing, then, you know, the best thing to do is to remind them that sh should you be infected, we still do, we have the antiviral Paxlovid. That's still a thing, and uh, that uh, you can go and get that uh, if uh, should it happen. Now, uh, according to uh, this, uh, to doctor, uh, the doctor. Sorry, I'm um, just going to look up her name again. Um, Iris Gorfinkel. She says that when it comes to uptake of the vaccines. Uh, when it comes to the one that's currently targeting XBB, only one in six people got it. So five out of six Canadians never got the XBB booster when it came out. That's according to federal data. Of those who did, nearly all of them were over six months ago because if all, all, all of us who are, again, who are under 16, not in those groups, uh, were told that we could skip the one from the spring. So, yes, all of us would have been over six months ago. Uh, now, the acceptance of the XBB vaccine did climb with age. Over half of Canadians 60 and over, which is usually the target group, actually did take it. So that's good with regard to that. But only one in 18 children under 17 had. So one in six overall for Canadians, more than one in two if they were over 60, but only one in 18 for children under 17. So the vast majority of Canadians, according to the uh, Dr. Iris uh, Gorfinkel, actually are now relying on immunity from vaccines taken long ago, plus whatever immunity they have from having had COVID in the past. But the problem is that protection from those immunities weakens over time and makes them more susceptible to having reinfections. And this is at a time that more, more contagious newer variants keep emerging. So uh, again, when asking about the recommendation, who's supposed to take it? So according to the NACI that we've mentioned, the National Advisory Committee, uh, Committee on Immunizations, they strongly recommend it for people 65 and over, anyone living in long-term care or congregate settings like group homes, or uh, student housing, 
Mm-hmm. Kids, of course, if someone had a severe allergic reaction or a problem with the vaccine, no, but otherwise, yes. Pregnant women, people living with underlying medical conditions, people from indigenous communities with regards to kids, that's strongly recommended for those with underlying medical conditions, whether it's lung, heart, liver, kidney problems, diabetes, asthma, and immune suppression. All of them should be vaccinated. People of racialized and other equity deserving communities should also get vaccinated. Uh, People providing essential community services that includes healthcare workers should get them. She says that the COVID shots can be given at the same time as the flu and pneumonia vaccines. Uh, Of course, recommends staying at home with sick, better masks and air filtration. Those still matter. Um, She said, consider that at least one in five people with with Omicron, or who had Omicron, Mm -hmm. had either no symptoms or very mild ones and did not realize they were contagious. So that's according to the U.S. National Institutes of Health. So again, right, you don't have to feel very, very, very sick or even feel that what you've got going on, you, know, you might just think, oh, yeah, this is just a regular cold. Well, it might not be. This, and you just might not know it because well, it's, it can be mild enough. The thing that we have to remember here that seems to be get lost in in the muck and mire of what's taking place is that there are thousands upon thousands of people in this country who have long COVID. Mm. And if you think it isn't real, I'm going to tell you right now, it very much is because I have a number of friends who have suffered from long COVID, literally capable of working two to three hours a day. If that, the rest of the time they're asleep. They're sleeping 19 to 20 hours a day because they have no energy whatsoever. Yep. And the brain fog, if they can get four hours out of a day and put two hours into work, I guarantee you the first two hours of the day are trying to get their head clear enough so that they can do two hours of work. Mm-hmm. This is becoming a very serious problem on the labor force. And how do we take care of people who have, have been infected with COVID and now have long COVID symptoms when there's insurance companies are not covering them? Mm-hmm. Do they yeah. suddenly have to go to on uh, onto disability? We all know how well that pays. Mm. I know people on disability who sit on street corners asking for change because they can't make ends meet. Indeed. Now, according to the doctor, uh, when asked, what's the argument in favor of getting vaccinated this time around, especially if you happen to have vaccine fatigue? Uh, people who got the recent XBB vaccine were 70% less likely to be hospitalized than those who had not. That's according to a recent review from the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, with regard to long COVID, the brain fog, fatigue, blood clots, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, all of that gets slashed in half by mm-hmm. getting vaccinated. So the chances of that. COVID-19 remains a multi-system disease with potential long risks that just keep going up every time a person gets reinfected. That has been confirmed according to a review in the journal Nature. And researchers found in the New England Journal of Medicine just this year that even even in mild cases, that adults who had recovered fully tested three points lower on an IQ test when compared to adults not infected and getting reinfected resulted in another two-point loss of IQ. I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind that, that, uh, (laughs) there's a good one from obsessive audio millions disabled with long COVID, but don't expect Chatham asset management to report on it. Chatham Mm -hmm. asset management in case you didn't know is what's known as post media who owns 66.6% of the newspapers in this country. Yep. They'll, they'll just bury that one. Yep. They'll bury the lead. Yep. So Dr. Iris Gorfinkel says each time a person gets vaccinated, they're boosting that protection from these post-COVID conditions. None of these vaccines are perfect. They do not prevent mild disease, but they certainly prevent people from getting super sick both immediately after and long after their acute system, their acute symptoms are resolved. So uh, that's with COVID. And uh, as we were mentioning uh, yesterday, we're talking about uh, Quebec and particularly the, the Laval region mm-hmm. being affected. Uh, well, according to the Ottawa Citizen, um, it seems like many of your friends and neighbors have been sick with COVID this summer. 
you are not wrong. This is according to Eliza, Elizabeth Payne at the Ottawa Citizen. Ottawa is experiencing a COVID-19 wave that is sending people to hospital, causing outbreaks in long-term care homes, retirement homes, and hospital wards, and even causing deaths among some of the most vulnerable. At least one local hospital has tightened masking requirements following outbreaks there, and Ottawa Public Health is advising students to take precautions when they head back to school, including staying at home when sick and wearing masks for their own protection and the protection of others. Health Canada, meanwhile, is expediting its review of three updated vaccines, that's what we were talking about, that target the variants driving the current states. Uh, relatively high rates of COVID seem likely to continue into the school year, which comes during a period of increased fall social activity, a recipe for even more spread. According to the most recent data from the Ottawa Public Health, at least six Ottawa residents died of COVID-19 during the first part of August, seven people died in July. During the week ending August 18th, 44 people were admitted to local hospitals with COVID-19 and there were 15 new and 11 ongoing COVID-19 outbreaks in Ottawa long-term care homes, retirement homes and hospitals, a number that is considered high. 80% mm -hmm. of people admitted to hospital with COVID-19 were over the age of 60. Unlike most communities in Ontario, Ottawa continues to track the virus that causes COVID-19 through wastewater. The Ontario government stopped funding the province's internationally recognized wastewater surveillance program as of the end of July. Ottawa is just one of a small handful of communities that is continuing to track wastewater for now. Extended funding for Ottawa's wastewater surveillance program runs out at the end of September. For now, that gives Ottawa public health officials a more accurate look at the amount of COVID-19 circulating in the community. Wastewater readings, which are at levels not seen since last winter, can serve as an early indicator for possible outbreaks. At a time when few people are being tested, wastewater surveillance along with hospitalizations and outbreak numbers provides a snapshot of the level of COVID-19 in the community. And in Ottawa right now, it is high. Not mm -hmm. near the peak of last winter, but continuing to spread. Unlike many other respiratory illnesses, COVID-19 is not seasonal. Summer waves, generally smaller than fall or winter waves, have been a feature throughout the pandemic but this year's is bigger than most in some parts of North America. The summer COVID wave is being driven by new variants known as FLIRT, named after technical names for their mutations. In the US, some states are seeing the highest summer surges of COVID-19 in years. Surges in infections led to the recent closure of two schools, one in Alabama and one in Tennessee, which returned to remote learning. The new variants, quote, have an extraordinary ability to bypass previous immunity, says University of Ottawa epidemiologist Raywat Dionandan. They don't necessarily make people sicker, but they have the ability to infect more people, which represents a threat to those who are most vulnerable to more severe outcomes from COVID-19 infections. The wave comes at a time when just 23% of Ottawa residents have received a COVID-19 vaccine since last September. The vast majority of people under the age of 60 have not been vaccinated in the past year. Vaccination rates are as high as 69% for older residents, nowhere near earlier vaccination rates. Many people, though, have an added layer of immunity from previous infections. The Ontario government offered a limited vaccination rollout last spring for older adults and those with compromised immune systems. The planned fall vaccination campaign will include updated vaccines for the general population. Last week, amid a substantial summer surge that is affecting more than 1 million people a day, according to some models, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved updated mRNA COVID-19 vaccines that more closely target the circulating virus strains than previous vaccines. Those vaccines are expected to begin rolling out in a matter of days. The U.S. government will also begin distributing free COVID-19 tests by mail beginning later in September. Health Canada is reviewing submissions from Pfizer and Moderna for vaccines that target the KP2 strain, according to a statement. It's also re reviewing a submission from Novavax for a COVID-19 vaccine targeting the JN2 strain. Uh, Those no, a note to Novavax, it's not on the fall vaccine menu. No, it's not. But like I said, I have not seen that confirmed yet by Health Canada. It says if you're not able to, yeah, no, this, I'm looking at something right here from, from Public Health. It's a, it's okay. a letter that was sent to a physician. Okay. And he said, I received a letter from public health confirming what we knew. Novavax is not on the fall vaccine menu. Though I was okay. a bit surprised, paraphrasing, if it, in quotations, if you're not able to receive the mRNA vaccine, there's Paxlovid. Yeah. Hardly the best alternative when there's a second vaccine type. So, yeah, I, I have a, yeah, it's as of, uh, yeah, that's what they're saying. Executive okay. Correspondents Unit, Public Health Agency of Canada. 
Uh, okay, I had missed that part of it. So then, yes, then then it's confirmed. Uh, so maybe they are still studying uh, the the JN two strain one, but it is not on the menu for the fall. Uh, so that that is that's now conclusive. Okay, good. And that's good to know. Uh, those reviews are being done on an expedited timeline, said Health Canada spokesperson Anna Madison. She said Health Canada is aiming to complete the review within 75 to 100 days compared to the performance standard of 180 days. Pfizer and Moderna produce mRNA vaccines. Novavax is a traditional protein subunit vaccine, which some people prefer. Health Canada says it will authorize the vaccines if, following an independent scientific review of the evidence, it determines they meet safety, quality, and efficacy standards. Um, so, uh, there you go with that. Let's see if there's anything else here at the end of this article. Uh, I have something that is health related, but not COVID related. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of other things as well with regard to, to, to respiratory stuff. Well, this isn't respiratory, but this has to do with the center for addiction and mental health. And okay. let me put this on the screen and then, right. well, um, Uh, for those of you who can't see that and who are listening at home, this is uh, from the Canadian uh, Addiction uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, CAMH. We're pleased to welcome Christine Elliott to our Board of Trustees. Christine was the Minister of Health and Deputy Premier of Ontario until 2022 and has significant knowledge of and experience with the health system. She also co-founded the Ability Centre. Uh... It was on her watch that, um, well, <laughs> battle-hardened military medics came out with PTSD from what they saw in long-term care homes in the province of Ontario. Under her watch when that occurred. So take that yeah. with ha however many grains of salt you wish. Yeah. That makes me, it, it pisses me off is what it does because that's just nepotism basically is what it is mm. it's i mean it's not actual nepotism but it's it falls right in line with it if you will because they're just giving her this job because she did something else but she did she did a terrible job at what she did yeah she indeed. mishandled the file thousands of people died that n did not need to yeah indeed so. indeed i got something to add on that that uh remind me to get back to um okay. sure now we don't have to, yeah, I got something about that, uh, Alberta related. Um, now, um, COVID is one thing, but there is another thing that is happening as well. And uh, that is um, pertussis. Mm. Otherwise, or AKA uh, whooping cough. Whooping cough. So according to the Canadian press, uh, whooping cough cases, whooping cough cases more than double pre-pandemic average, according to uh, Toronto Public Health. Um, Toronto Public Health says the number of whooping cough cases in Toronto are more than double the pre-pandemic average. The Public Health Agency is reporting 99 cases so far this year compared to the pre-pandemic five-year average of 38. Whooping cough, also known as pertussis, is a cyclical disease that occasionally increases every two to six years in Ontario. It's highly contagious, persistent cough that's of most concern for infants. Toronto Public Health says 41% of cases are found in 10 to 14-year-olds. Last week, New Brunswick health officials said whooping cough outbreak there had spread across the province, pointing to 141 reported cases so far this year. That well exceeded the province's annual average of 34 cases. Um, whooping cough uh, can be treated or prevented with vaccines. There is a pertussis vaccine as well. So, uh, there's a recommendation as well if your uh, children um, have missed out on the regular vaccine schedule as a result of the epidemic to uh, not forget uh, to get the whooping cough uh, one. And also uh, maybe if you're a senior and uh, think it might be time for a booster, uh, that uh, could be there. There is also uh, RSV that we have to be concerned for. The last two years, RSV got really bad at uh, the beginning of the back to school season. Haven't heard much about it so far yet this year. Um, 
but that's uh, something that we need to keep uh, an eye out for as well. Now, the other thing that may be interesting, uh, because we talk about mRNA and you were talking about the technology, uh, Mr. Grizzly, mm -hmm. that it's been around for a while. Um, according to The Guardian, world's first lung cancer vaccine trials. Yes, mRNA. Seven countries, exactly. So doctors have begun. Uh, this is, yeah, The Guardian. Uh, no author written, so I'm guessing it's... Oh, I know they've been working on one in, in Cuba for a number of years now. Yeah, so this is Andrew Gregory from The Guardian. Doctors have begun trialing the world's first mRNA lung cancer vaccine in patients as experts hailed its groundbreaking potential to save thousands of lives. Lung cancer is the world's leading cause of cancer death, accounting for about 1.8 million deaths every year. Survival rates in those with advanced forms of the disease where tumors have spread are particularly poor. Now experts are testing a new jab that instructs the body to hunt down and kill cancer cells, then prevents them ever coming back. Known as BNT116 and made by BioNTech, the vaccine is designed to treat non-small cell lung cancer, NSCLC, the most common form of the disease. The phase one... Oh, have we lost you? Oh, we lost Mr. Grizzly, Mr. Beaver there. I don't know what happened. Oh, he's right back. Yeah. Oh. You froze right. for a second there. I don't know. You just froze, then you went off and came right back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the phase one clinical trial, the first human study of BNT116, has launched across 34 research sites in seven countries, the UK, the US, Germany, Hungary, Poland, Spain, and Turkey. The UK has six sites located in England and Wales, with the first UK patient to receive the vaccine having had their initial dose on Tuesday. So this is for real that this is... Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know what's happening there. It seems to pe keep popping in and out for some reason. I don't know. You're just, it, it's just glitched in and out real quick. It's almost right. like your power went out or something, except you're on your phone. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's going on. No worries. So, uh, so this is real. This is happening. They're not just yes. designing the trial or whatnot like this. That, like vaccines are being administered here. Overall, about 130 patients from early stage before surgery or radiotherapy to late stage disease or recurrent cancer will be enrolled to have the jab alongside immunotherapy. About 20 will be from the UK. The jab uses messenger mRNA, uh, messenger RNA, similar to COVID-19 vaccines and works by presenting the immune system with tumor markers from NSCLC to prime the body to fight cancer cells expressing these markers. The aim is to strengthen a person's immune response to cancer while leaving healthy cells untouched, unlike chemotherapy. Quote, we are now entering this very exciting new era of mRNA-based immunotherapy clinical trials to investigate the treatment of lung cancer, says Professor Xiao Ming Li, consultant medical oncologist at the University College London Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust, which is leading the trial in the UK. Quote, it's simple to deliver, and you can select specific antigens in the cancer cell, and then you target them. This technology is the next big phase of cancer treatment. Janusz Rax, 67, from London, was the first person to have the vaccine in the UK. He was diagnosed in May and soon after started chemotherapy and radiotherapy. The scientist who specializes in AI said his profession inspired him to take part in the trial. Quote, I'm a scientist too, and I understand that the progress of science, especially in medicine, lies in people agreeing to be involved in such investigations. It would be very beneficial for me because it's a new methodology not available for other patients that can help me to get rid of the cancer. And also, I can be part of the team that can provide a proof of concept for this new methodology, and the faster it would be implemented across the world, more people will be saved. He's received six consecutive injections, five minutes apart, over 30 minutes, at uh, the facility on Tuesday. Each jab contained different RNA strands. He will get the vaccine every week for six consecutive weeks and then every three weeks for 54 weeks. Lee said, we hope that adding this additional treatment will stop the cancer coming back because a lot of time for lung cancer patients, even after surgery and radiation, it does come back. He said, I've been in lung cancer research for 40 years now. When I started in the 1990s, nobody believed chemotherapy worked. We now know about there are 20 to 30 percent of patients stay alive with stage four with immunotherapy, and now we want to improve the survival rates. So hopefully this mRNA vaccine on top of immunotherapy might provide the extra boost. We hope to go on to phase two and phase three, and then hope it becomes standard of care worldwide and saves lots of cancer patients. That's excellent. 
It'll I be wonder, I wonder, I wonder if now you, if this, I'm positing a theory here. I wonder if as they roll this out for you to be eligible, do they have to, uh, do they, do they help you to stop smoking? Or, you know, are they going to say, sorry, you smoke, you don't get it. I, they can't do that. Can they do mm-hmm. that? I, you know what I mean? It, it's like you cannot get a transplant if you're not up on your vaccinations. Exactly. But you can produce more vaccine, right? It's not like you can just come up with a new liver or a lung. Right. So, so I, I, don't I wonder. Be reason. Yeah, well, and again, it's a vaccine against the disease. So, and there are people who develop lung cancer who've never smoked. Right. My, my friend's sister died of lung cancer about a year and a half ago. Never smoked in her life. It was her workplace environment yep. that caused it and killed her. So, yep. you know, there, there are people who develop it from secondhand smoke. There are people who develop it just from the environment that they happen to be working in when, mm-hmm. when there's not necessarily any tobacco smoke around. Right. So this, this can help millions of people and it will lead to more vaccines that will help alleviate more diseases. Uh, couple that with CRISPR and AI technology working together, we're, what, 30, 30 years, maybe less, from technically coming up with med bed technology, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It will I mean, be it really. It happen within our lifetime. It can happen. Yeah. It will be really interesting to see, too, for in terms of the anti vax movement, because, you know, um, vaccine for like, COVID or something like that, you know, you may or may not get or, you know, or diseases that where we seem to have forgotten how bad they can be because we haven't seen them Mm -hmm. uh, act up as vaccines. Uh, But lung cancer scares the living daylights out of a lot of people. So it would be really interesting. No, no, uh, the mRNA vaccine technology is the devil when it comes to COVID. But, oh, lung cancer, yeah, uh, right here please. Yeah. Well, this one from obsessive audio, how ironic would it be if cancer cures came from the MRNA tech, the same tech that club brainworm spent the last three years vilifying. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 there's going to be some interesting conundrums. Yeah. Well, I think at the end of the day, you look at any, um, physician who has taken their Hippocratic oath, it's like, do no harm, save every life, period. It, it, there is an interesting, from, from Saucy Sea Witch here though, a very brutal question. If we save people from cancer, we need to discuss the population. More people will be living longer lives. A brutal factor to consider. Yeah. I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there are wealthy people in positions of power who consider this. Some of those wealthy people are like, hey, if we have more people alive, we can sell more products. And other people consider, how are we going to feed everybody? Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of, of uh, issues to be resolved. How about we come up with replicators for food? Yeah. How much you want to bet that there are people who are actually trying to figure out a way to make that happen? Hmm. I mean, 3D printing was science fiction. Now it's very much science fact. What we're doing right now, this show that people can watch on their phones, that was science fiction when I was a kid. 30 years ago, what we're doing right now, 30 years ago, was not achievable. It was, it was dreamt of in 1994. They dreamt that we could be doing this and said one day it will happen, but the technology didn't exist at the time. So who's to say in 30 years from now where we'll be? Mm -hmm. Like I said, with mRNA technology, new vaccines coming online every day, and utilizing CRISPR to help alter people's DNA so that you can eliminate disease. These, you know, the future is very bright and exciting as well as terrifying. (laughs) It's a combination. It's the double-edged sword, if you will. It is. It is, right? It's it's, it's that... uh... A saying, I think it's a per- philosopher, I think Pericles, I think was his name, who sort of something like, uh, it's not word for word, but everything in the universe is a remedy or a poison. The difference is the dose. Right. <laughs> yes, that's true. 
true. Um, now, uh, you mentioned Christine Elliott. Uh, and I took a pin in that because that's something for you. Uh, David Kleiman Haga. Oh, our friend David. We should get him back Who on the you? show. I know. I know. He's, uh, uh, he's hard to get a hold of, but he does really good work. Um, a, a, a listener of ours named Joanne mm -hmm. uh, sent me something and uh, uh, gave us some really nice compliments. So oh, thank, thank you. Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Um, and, uh, but then uh, mentioned something to us. So hold on. Let's see if I can find that because she said that we should uh, look at something. Um, we that the, anyway, she she referred me to something, and I thought that uh, it was a very 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 good good idea that I look at it. Um, so I'm going to read something a little cryptically, and then uh, you might uh, eventually guess who I'm talking about. There is a former health minister in Alberta. Mm -hmm. Now this was written in the flashback, June 2nd, 2024. Okay. So there's a former health minister in Alberta who has been a member of the board of Covenant Health since December, 2023. But at that time in June, hardly anybody knew about that because it would appear outside the upper levels of the Roman Catholic Church-owned, publicly financed healthcare organization, Alberta's second largest provider of healthcare services. Health. Yes. There had been no press release from Covenant Health announcing the appointment of this former health minister. Probably because it was going to be Everyone. somewhat controversial given this particular former health minister's performance in office. Likewise, no kind words from Covenant Health CEO Patrick Dumely welcoming the former senior cabinet minister to the board have been published anywhere the public can see them. Similarly, there have been no news stories in the media, not that Google can find any anyway. There, have, there hasn't been any chatter on social media until about June 1st, when mm -hmm. someone noticed this person's photograph and potted biography extolling their virtues on Covenant Health's website and sent a direct message via the social media platform, Twitter, to The Breakdown, an account that publishes video commentaries on Alberta politics. So to The Breakdown goes the scoop. It turns out that this former health minister's biography also went live on the Covenant Health site the Wayback Machine, where wave ar web archive shows. But his mug shot uh, was loaded to the site in April, but not posted to a public page. Mm. Hmm. Since Covenant Health Board, chaired by former progressive conservative Premier Ed Stelnick. Mm -hmm. Name rings a bell. They all seem to... Uh, find themselves in the same place, don't they? Selects yeah, peculiar a, that. Eh? <laughs> yes. So since the board selects and appoints its own members, the UCP government would have had no official role in the appointment, but given Premier Daniel Smith's intense interest in health care, it seems like the, the UCP gave its imprimatur to the appointment. Ooh, points for the use of imprimatur. Why <laughs> Covenant Health cho chose to appoint Point this person to the board and then not announce it for at least five months is unstated, although the obvious inference is the controversy their appointment is bound to arouse and Covenant Health desire to put off having to deal with it for as long as possible. Elected as the MLA for the Calgary Acadia riding in 2019 general election, this person was given the health portfolio by then UCP Premier Jason Kenney with a mandate that included cutting human resources costs. Earlier in his tenure, he attracted international attention for his ham-handed efforts to dodge reporters' questions about the future of a working group on banning conversion therapy. Things then went downhill. There are missteps and controversies as health minister became notorious. They included unilaterally pulling up a plug on an agreement with the Alberta Medical Association, starting a war on doctors that prompted a lawsuit by the AMA and led many physicians to leave the province. 
So with that, I think we mentioned yesterday, uh, it was uh, uh, over 2,400 of them or something like that that left uh, the province or just decided that, uh, yeah, we're, we're not yeah. We're, we're retiring now. A no-confidence vote in their performance by 98% of the province's physicians. Promotion of the Babylon Virtual Medicine smartphone app as a replacement for seeing a physician, followed by a privacy concerns about the app. The company that first promoted the app has since gone broke. Use of a blind trust for a family business run by his wife that was criticized for being legally able to open and close like a Venetian blind. Being photographed among the guests at Mr. Kenny's boozy mid-pandemic patio party. Most famously throwing an epic tantrum in a neighbor's driveway over a critical post on social media that mentioned the family business. The meltdown resulted in a hearing into which said former minister violated the Law Society of Alberta's Code of Conduct. The hearing concluded last fall, but no decision has been announced. In September 2021, the heat was intense enough that Mr. Kenny shuffled his cabinet, switching this person to Labour and the Labour Minister, Jason Copping, to health. We're not talking about Mr. Copping. Mr. Copping enjoyed some success pouring oil on the troubled waters in health in February 22. This person, who is now on the board of Covenant Health, was shuffled again to the Justice portfolio after Justice Minister Casey, do you know who I am, Madhu, got into hot water for talking about a distracted driving ticket with an Edmonton police chief, Dale McPhee, and suggesting maybe I was stopped because of the color of my skin? Maybe? <coughs> maybe? <coughs> Perhaps? <coughs> I said something. <coughs> maybe? Want to make that ticket go away? <coughs> Maybe, perhaps. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this uh, gentle uh, person remained in that portfolio until the May 29, 2023 general election when he was defeated in his riding by the NDP's Diana Batten, a registered nurse who is now the opposition critic for child care, child and family services. Ms. Batten won by 25 votes. Every vote counts. Every vote counts, including yours. Yes. Remember Mr. that, please. Mr. Copping, by the way, was defeated in the Calgary Varsity writing by Calgary physician and university professor Luan Metz, who is now the opposition health critic. It seems that being the Minister of Health in this government guarantees that uh, you don't get reelected mm. <clears throat> for some reason. What do I? Covenant Health operates facilities at 17 sites in 12 communities throughout Alberta, employing about 11,000 people. Major hospitals include the Grey Nuns Community Hospital, Misericordia Hospital in Edmonton. Covenant's health board is appointed by and accountable to the Catholic bishops of Alberta. Since the creation of Alberta Health Services in 2009, 2009, Covenant operations have been closely integrated with AHS. It's not clear, however, if that level of coordination will survive the policies of the Smith government. Well, we found out recently that it won't, but this was written in June of last year. And this person that conveniently finds themselves on the board of Covenant House after ripping up all the contracts with the doctors during COVID is none other than Tyler Sandro. Yeah. Like I said, not textbook nepotism, but quid pro quo, quid pro quo. You scratch the my back, you know. The incestuous circle jerk. Again, who says conservatives don't believe in recycling? No shit. <laughs> no shit. Wow. They That's were so proud to bring him on that they kept the fact that they brought him on secret for five whole months. Yeah. 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 This is how they do it. They destroy it from the inside out. Yep. So um, you loved him as your health minister, Alberta. You loved him as your MP. Because you didn't re-elect him. And then you got yourself, you got yourself done on health first, and then you didn't re-elect him. But now, he's the one that gets to help put a pastor between you and your doctor. Especially if your kid is trans, or especially if you're the parents of a trans kid who's supportive of them getting hormone therapy or, you know, 
gender reassignment surgery if they are old enough and they've gone through all the stages, or if you are someone that might be considering medical assistance in dying, or maybe getting an abortion, or maybe contraception. No matter how many times you reject this Tyler Shadrow guy, you keep on seeming to get him. Somehow. Someone really, 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 really wants him um, to be could, involved in your health care. Could that be, oh, I don't know, the same guy that's on the board of Kushtard? Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who stands to make big money from the sale of alcohol in Ontario 7-Eleven stores? Yes, some 7-Elevens are already... Uh, saying that they're 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 that they're selling yeah and that's not supposed to start until the fifth yes some of them some of them have, have already declared their full intention yep you can use as many drugs as you want but only if we get to profit off of it is what it boils down to that's what it is it's all about profit it's all about uh, disaster capitalism Yep. Exactly. Disaster capitalism, capitalism is even more profitable when the disasters can be created. Why wait for one? Exactly. Yeah. They will destroy our health care from the inside, just like they're destroying our school boards from the inside. These are not well-intentioned people. Nope. I'll bet you every single one of them have a copy of Project 2025. Oh. How much you want to put money down on that one? Yep. They're at least pulling pages from that playbook. Oh, I got I got a couple of quick hits for you before we uh, jump out. Yep. Um, there's a, apparently there's a scheduled uh, August 31st, 2024 from 1030 to 5 p.m. local time. Please join us at Confederation Park in Ottawa. Or? Convoy celebration thing. Oh. Uh, uh, and there's, I've got a clip of a guy accusing, I don't know who any of these people are. Uh, so here's a, it's the clip where Gary accuses Adrian, Angel, and Jeremy of plotting to overthrow the government and discussing potential violence. I don't know who any of these people are, but they're all, I guess, within the convoy. Uh, leadership? Organization? I guess they're about as organized as Antifa is. So I don't know what to make of that. Here's another thing. I want to I show you something from uh, our... Uh, from uh, Minister Gould. Uh, she spoke with reporters yesterday. Here's a clip and, and uh, well, wait till you hear the question and her response. You're going to love this, sir. Mm -hmm. To the end of June. Speaking of the U.S., you might have seen that the Democrats, of course, swapped out their leader for someone new, and Kamala Harris is enjoying kind of a wave of popularity, and she surged in the polls and is now competitive with Donald Trump, and there's a lot of enthusiasm among party members. Have you taken anything away from that for the Canadian example? Does that give you pause and make you think maybe we should do something here and swap out Trudeau and go for somebody who could revive the Liberal Party fortunes here? <laughs> uh, good question. Um, look, Canada and the U.S., although there are similarities, there are a lot of differences and you know just because the Democrats do something in the United States does not then mean that uh, we should be doing that here in Canada as Liberals. What I do think is that progressive voters um, are looking for that continued hope, right? That continued um, ability to make progress, um, advance uh, how we are building a inclusive and progressive society and economy. And I think, you know, what our job as Liberals is to demonstrate to Canadians that that's the path that we're on and that's the path that we must continue on because we do face headwinds from, to be honest, some pretty extreme right-wing views in our own country right now. And so let's make sure that we are putting forward that plan, that agenda, that vision for Canada um, that I believe Canadians want to choose. I'm gonna... So let me just stop that there. And, and what I want to compare and contrast is I'm going to show you the start of this in a sec, but my compare and contrast is they ask, are we going to do, uh, is the Liberal Party going to do what the Democrats did and replace Biden? But they never ask... Do you find it strange that Pierre Polyev pulls from the playbook of Donald Trump on a daily? <laughs> that what page? Never, right? Page. Start with the page. Start with the page. Which page? What page? 
I love how she starts this conference. Watch this. Hi, good morning. Glad to be here. Glad to be back. Uh, happy to take any questions that you have. Just like that? Just that like that. Fantastic. Just like that. Um, <laughs> Welcome. Just uh, like that. Just like that. Yep. Yeah. Welcome back from maternity leave, Minister Gould. Yes. You have been missed. We would love to have you on the show as a guest because we really do appreciate your uh, earnestness, your honesty, your truthfulness, and your well thought out uh, answers to questions because you are obviously much quicker on your feet than anybody in the opposition party appears to be. And you don't sling mud, you spit facts. Boy, she you. also doesn't suffer fools lightly. No, she does not. <laughs> oh, I like her. She packed like up. Her chat here if anybody wants to watch the entire uh, exchange it's it's only about 10 minutes so it's not it, 10 10 minutes and 54 seconds so it's not a long exchange it's worth your 10 minutes and 54 seconds yeah exactly jake crick what unscripted <laughs> uh -huh. yeah 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 and and also where you take your questions not you or you just go ahead fire away yep uh, one more question no just fire away that's it okay all right i'll see you later <laughs> they're not I love how they always like to say, well, you know, the, the town halls that Trudeau has, they vet that. No, they don't. The only thing they do is make sure that the people are um, secure enough to be in the hall. They don't care right. what their po political stripe is. If you're going to have a town hall with the prime minister, they want to make sure that you are, uh, you have no federal charges against you. You're not carrying any weapons. You're safe to be there, et cetera, et cetera. And ask him a question. He'll answer it. Period. And that's the big contrast, whereas the, the Pierre Polyev rallies, the ego strokes, are only by people that he vets as actual supporters. Yep. It, remember what happened? We had a gentleman on not too long ago who showed up, a, a fellow from Greenpeace, real nice gentleman in Toronto. Yep. Who was escorted out for simply asking a question. Because it, it ran contrary to what uh, Pierre Polyev's messaging is. So they immediately. I believe, I believe he had unfurled a banner, but was not yes, disruptive. Yes. That's right. He unfurled a banner, was not disruptive. And they, they escorted him out. And when they got him outside, like, what are we doing this for? Like, they, they didn't even know why he, they were taken away. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Compare and contrast. Uh, the, there was one other thing I wanted to show you that uh, I thought was pretty interesting. And this is from Global News. And it has to do with something that we talk about frequently. A new report is calling on provincial governments in Atlantic Canada to do more to bridge a gap between what people earn and what they need to pay for their basic needs. Yeah. The report by the Nova Scotia Office of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives says that while living wage rates are broadly comparable across the Atlantic region, the cost of living is not. It defines the living wage as the hourly take-home pay, including federal and provincial transfers, that a person needs to pay for things such as rent, clothing, shelter, transportation, health care, and basic household expenses. Now, household, I said household. <laughs> Do you know what the um, wage should be? Living nope. wage in Halifax? Take some wild guesses. I'd like to see people throw in the chat here what the wild guesses are, what the current... Wait estimated living wages for Halifax because I'll show you in a minute or two and when I show you this you're going to go like holy crap what it is or what it should be Halifax living wage estimated at so what it should be what it should be uh, what the living wage should be 2275 it's higher really quite a bit higher yep quite a bit higher dang Minimum wage is $15. Cost of living is about 22 on average, and that's where Saucy Sea Witch is, and that's in a part of uh, southern Nova Scotia. PNC BIOS is 25 down, 100K. Mr. Jim, 85K. Uh, well, according to the recent study, and this is from Global News, Halifax living wage estimated at 28.30 an hour. Now, let's scroll down here and remember what it says. Um, it finds the living wage as the hourly take-home pay, including federal. So take-home pay, right? So you have to cut the taxes off of that. So twenty-eight thirty an hour would be take-home pay. So that's closer to about thirty-five, thirty-six dollars an hour. That's the living wage. 
Now, maybe I have that formula wrong. Maybe 2830 is what they've calculated as the living wage. Uh, you know, subtract the taxes for your, for your take-home pay. Right. 30, $35 an hour, I think, would be closer, to be honest with you, because less than that and you're barely making ends meet in a city and anybody who knows what's going on in, in Nova Scotia these days, because the population has surged past a million. Halifax is over 500,000 right now and growing right. rapidly. Jeez. So let me just get, pull it up here. Canada's population clock in real time. We're currently at 41,652,860 Canada wide. Uh, Nova Scotia currently 1,085,129. It surpassed the 1 million mark last summer. And uh, uh, half of the population resides in Halifax in the, in the greater Halifax Dartmouth area. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and, and so many people from Ontario during the pandemic says, well, I'm, I'm going to move to Nova Scotia because I can buy a house there for cheap. Well, anybody who lives in that part of the world will tell you that housing is no longer cheap. Mm-hmm. When I just came, I was in my mom's hometown a few weeks ago and they were telling me two bedrooms are renting for 1700 a month. Trust me when I say this, that is a ton of money in small town, New Brunswick. Well, technically it is a city. It's Miramichi city, but I mean, Miramichi city is, I think it's about Mm 25,000. So in a town of 25,000, 17 to $1,800 a month. And I just did a, a, a dive in yesterday to see what because, you know, my building was purchased by a new owner and I wanted to see what they want to rent out apartments at. One bedroom, so one like mine, is 1950 So how soon before they try and rent evict me, right? Because I don't, I pay less than half of that. I pay half of that, actually. Half that amount. So you know they'll want to try and get me out. Yeah. There's, so there's a bachelor, one bedroom and two bedrooms. Well, it looks like they're turning some two bedrooms into three bedrooms in this building because they're renovating, knocking down walls and changing things. Okay. Three bedrooms are going to rent for twenty nine fifty, which is almost $36,000 a year. Jeez. Um, okay, so your, <laughs> your living wage is got to be really high to be able to afford $36,000 a year in rent. I said it's yeah. not exactly 36, but it's damn close. Somebody do the math, 2950. What are we, a few hundred bucks off of 36K? Right. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I could, I could not afford that. It, it, if they try and rent evict me, I'm going to fight him fight tooth and nail. Everybody on my floor, we've discussed this. Mm-hmm. Like, no, this is my home. This is my neighborhood. I've been here 14, going on 15 years. I cannot afford to live in this neighborhood anymore if I have to move out of this building. Mm-hmm. I can't because rents are so ridiculously high. There's a building just up the street from me that was just built and one bedrooms that are 700 square feet. So that is 50 square feet larger than mine. And you've been to my place many times. So 50 square feet larger than mine, which is about the size of my studio, right? Mm -hmm. 29.50 for a one bedroom. They're like, well, it's a luxury and it has blood. I go, who the hell can afford that? Yeah. It has to be couples moving into a one bedroom because one person, unless you're earning one hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year, that is a huge chunk of your income. Yeah. Indeed. Oh, I mean, and how do we, how do we change that? Well, it's rent. I don't know how you can change it. You, this is a rent controlled building, but as they're spending thousands of dollars to renovate apartments, you watch and see they'll get a one-time dispensation to raise my rent by 10% next year, which will be uh, uh, a bite. It'll, it'll be a, a large increase. But I can, I can still, actually, right now at this moment, I can survive it. I don't know where I'll be in four months from now if I don't have a, a job that generates revenue. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, mass immigration is directly responsible. That's not entirely true, uh, Morgan. It's not entirely true. It's a contributing factor. Greed is also a large factor. That's a massive factor. And the immigration, you have to remember, was spurred by the provinces because they were requiring more and more people to come in and do the jobs that, well, people who look like me refused to do. They wanted more people to come in, but didn't want rent controls at the same time. 
And you also have to remember that a lot of that immigration had to do with colleges and universities. Uh, the provinces were cutting their funding left, right, and center. So the colleges and universities says, well, we're going to have to bring in foreign students to help underwrite our costs because foreign students pay something like 50%, 60% more. So that's how they're being funded largely right now. And then you had all these strip mall colleges that Doug Ford allowed to happen because the Wynn government had shut them down. Doug Ford allowed them to happen, so they brought even more people in. And they get here and have no place to live. And it turns out this strip mall college is, is um, two classrooms that can hold 30 people each, and 10,000 people are registered there. This is not something I'm making up. This has all been proven to be factual. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of contributing factors. It's not just mass immigration. It has to do with how the mass immigration is taking part. And you also got to remember, uh, Ontario and Alberta are demanding more. They want to increase their numbers each year. So what's the solution? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But it has to be things that to curb the demand and then increase the supply. Well, as you know, as we start to build... You know, as the federal government is starting to build more and more houses for people and, and, and MDUs, multiple dwelling units, apartment buildings, as an example, mm -hmm. we can get people housed quicker and faster. And there's a lot of them taking place here in Ottawa. The, the, the difficult aspect of, because um, in, in, in a city, it's bu built at the municipal level, funded by the province but the province hasn't been funding it for a long time. So the municipalities are trying to fund it. So it's slow to get money together to build the projects. A friend of mine who does work for a developer had uh, decided she wanted to do something to help people and got into development with the city to work on nonprofit housing and low-income housing. And she quit after a year, she said, because there's so much red tape involved and so much so many checks and balances that need to be taken care of before you can put a shovel in the ground, let alone proposing to put a shovel in the ground. She says, it takes too long to get it done. So she went back to the private sector and is now working to have the private sector do more of this type of work. Whereas when the federal government comes in to build houses, they're just going through all of it and doing it quickly on land that's already been set aside for this. So there are a lot of contributing factors. Housing is a, is a problem, yes. Uh, why is housing prices so high? Well, greed is a large part of it. With mortgage rates being as what they are, and people go, they're so high right now. And I go, <laughs> I remember 1984 when they were like 24%. Mm -hmm. That's higher than your Visa card. <laughs> so, you know, people were, there was still a demand and a housing shortage then. Housing wasn't as ridiculously uh, expensive in 1984 as it is today. Back then it was like, two times or in, in a lot of cases, three times your annual salary. Well, today, 10 to 50 times. It depends on what part of the country you're living in and what your average salary is. There's a lot of factors involved. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. It's a very complex uh, situation, one that I do not have a solution for, nor would I suggest I do. There are smarter people than me that are working on this. Hopefully the problem can be alleviated because I don't think it will ever actually be solved. But if we can take some pressure points off here and there, I think we can make things better for everybody. How to do that? I'm not a politician. I'm not that smart. I just happen mm -hmm. to have a deep voice and a microphone. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment here. It says that uh, the number of immigration we are getting, you need to build over 1 million homes a year to break even. I'm not sure that that's exactly the number. I think it would be a little lower than that or substantially lower than that. Mm -hmm. It would be in the hundreds of thousands because, um, you know, one million would suggest that everybody that's coming in is living alone, which is not. Yeah. And that's not the case. No, not that's not the case. And, and many um, people are sponsored by family members and live with family for, well, actually years until they can save up to buy their own place. Right. I guess. And you no, know, now if you like, you know, we, we also have a backlog, so I mean, that number is higher. But yeah, it, it, but we are still, even at, at the rate that they're suggesting that we need to cover like this, we're going to, you know, they're saying that we need to build like that for maybe like, you know, uh, seven to 10 years in order to have a supply that matches the population, also projecting for future immigration growth with that. So, I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, we're behind. We're definitely behind. 
Oh, yes. Uh, before we go, uh, a couple of the little bits of news, uh, kids and cubs. Um, there will be uh, the sentence here, sentencing hearing today for the convicted serial killer in Winnipeg um, who murdered four Indigenous women, um, Mercedes Myron, Morgan Harris, Rebecca Contois, and a fourth woman known as Buffalo Woman. Um, that is uh, starting uh, to take place today. It is um, suggested because he was convicted last month on four counts of first degree murder, uh, but um, suffered from a very, very uh, specific form uh, of schizophrenia um, that he might be sentenced um, to four mandatory concurrent life sentences with no mm. parole eligibility for 25 years. Uh, and it's, the hearing is more of a formality. It looks pretty certain that this person will will get this because normally at a sentencing hearing, one side makes a case, the other side makes a case, and the judge will some, come down somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, uh, it, it, it was gruesome. And this person suffers from a, uh, like I said, a, a form of uh, schizophrenia mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, very, very specific and particularly uh, leads people, leads them to do things that are particularly pathological uh, here. Um, well, and you, you have, you're, a, you're someone who's up close and personal to schizophrenia and what it does to a person. Yeah, but like nothing like this, right? No, 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 but you, you still, you've seen, yeah. like, you know. Yeah. I just wanted to read this here from Brent quickly. Um, Brent Whiteside watching on X. You can follow us, uh, Brent, on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, I'll put the link up in a second. But he says, I live in a new 55, uh, a, a new over 55, one bedroom. So it's, it's a building for people who are over the age of 55 years of age. And the people whose leases are coming up for renewal after the first year are being jacked $500 a month. It's because it's a new building. They can jack it as high as they want. That will be twenty two hundred a month for me living on CPP and OAS. I can't do it when my lease comes up for renewal. I Brent, I feel for you, man. I'm fifty six. Uh, I'm not in an over fifty five building. My building's over fifty five, but I am really worried about what'll happen to me and people like me and like you when things like that start to happen. Five hundred dollar a month increase. I can't handle that. I don't even have a job right now. So it's like, what happens? Do I get tossed out onto the street? This is how we make, we, homelessness is a, a problem that we create. It's created out of greed. It's what it is. It's created out of greed. <sighs> Dark days indeed. Um, so yeah, uh, this uh sentencing hearing for this person that uh, killed and dismembered four people and dumped their bodies in the landfill mm -hmm. uh it's even though the, it's a formality uh it's still very very important to the community because they will be able to deliver uh their impact statements oh good uh, and uh they will be able to get that on the record uh so uh, very very important and uh the search uh, of the landfill is about to begin for the remains of two of the women. Uh, I'm not sure when if they had concluded that they might be the other two might be in different parts of the landfill. The I don't know. Search. I, I, it wasn't very, the news reporting wasn't clear as to why uh, only for two at the moment. Uh, but the search is about to begin for the remains of the two. Uh, with their families long insisting that justice includes finding those remains. Uh, so that's uh, very important uh, news. And uh, the other uh, bit of news that you can use is according to the Insurance Bureau of Canada, uh, they have just released figures from the summer and they show that the devastating wildfire in Jasper National Park last month resulted in more than 880 80 million dollars in insured damage making it the second most expensive wildfire in alberta history wow it's 
costing a lot of money, kits and cubs. Ignoring okay. money, costing a lot of money. Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. All right, kits and cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us. It's very, very important. If you would like to support us, well, then you need to take a tip from the Ray Girl. QR code just appeared underneath my chin. And if you scan that, that brings you to our pod page. If you're listening, that's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you go there and click subscribe, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. So please do that. We really appreciate it. And if you would like to help us in other ways, then you need to make like Kit Elaine and surf on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page, as uh, it seems 5,750 of you have already. And uh, we have some buttons there for you, like, share, and subscribe. So uh, make like Kit Elaine and smash with them. Makes us happy. It does indeed. I'm happy. And if you'd like to help us in other ways, the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head will bring you to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko ficom slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters all in one word. And there you will find our tip jar. And if you'd like to leave us a little bit of money there to help us produce the show uh, or to offer us support and encouragement, well, we definitely, definitely appreciate that. And we thank you for your generosity. If you can't contribute financially, it doesn't matter because the gift of your participation is the one we cherish the most. And we love to hear from you. True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com, at True Eager on our Twitter feed, True North Eager Beaver on Facebook, or leaving a comment if you happen to be watching on our YouTube page right now. Hey, we like to read what you have to say. Good, yeah, bad, or ugly. Indeed. Just if it's ugly, please be kind. Be gentle. <laughs> yeah, no need to be nasty. There's enough nastiness in this world. We don't need to add to it, right? We we have feelings, too. <laughs> Despite <laughs> what you mean. <laughs> yes. Constructive criticism and compliments are both welcome because it's your show, too, Kids and Cups. Because democracy is something that you do, hey, why not to make an attempt? There's a campaign on uh, to buy a, a, a seat at the Paralympics in order to support the para, Paralympic uh, Canadians. I think uh, the Olympic team is Paralympic team is looking to raise one million dollars by selling seats at uh, twenty five dollars a seat. Uh, and they they light up, and I'm guessing that they're going to make some type of display or use of it somehow during mm -hmm. the Paralympics. Um, but I encourage you to do that or to buy a t-shirt from our wheelchair basketball team. If you go in our show notes, uh, you will definitely find the link in there. So uh, we appreciate that. Of course, by elections coming, all that good stuff. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? Well, I'm going to share this first before I give you the words of wisdom. You can now join the channel, and we have three different uh, subscription levels, uh, loyalty member, executive member, and VIP member. And I am in the process of creating more content for members, as is Mr. Beaver. We will be uh, getting stuff to you. I've got, we've got one clip up. I've got more to come. We're just kind of busy right now. So get it to you as quickly as you can. We'll have some in-depth stuff coming up as well, and there will be some bonus things coming your way in the near future when it comes to that. But as for words of wisdom for today, sorry, I just have to fix something here quickly and then I'll be right back with you. There we go. That worked. Okay. Excellent. Something was broken there and I had to fix it. As of words of wisdom today, something that I've talked about many times in the past and I'll continue to wax on about it poetically is that we need to remind each other as our motto here is democracy is something that you do. And it's important to make sure that everybody you know gets out to vote in every election we have that you're capable of voting in. Because if you don't, if you sit back and say, well, according to the polls, so-and-so is going to win and I don't want that guy, so my vote won't count. Not true. Your vote does count. And a lot of those polls are meant to dissuade you from voting altogether, which is why I want to lobby my member of parliament and my member of provincial parliament to table a bill that says once the writ is dropped, Polls cannot publicly be, rele be released. 
they can release polls to the parties, but not public because they sway the public, as did in the last provincial election in the province of Ontario, when newspapers had said, well, Doug's going to win anyway. So we got a 43% turnout. Democracy is something that you do and you need to be active and proactive in it. So please vote in every election, municipal, provincial, federal. They all count, every single one of them. All right. Jen, Kit Jen, we are still sending you lots of love, you and your family. Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. I've uh, just been having a conference with uh, Mr. Uh, McBear here. Uh, says that uh, we've done very well over the last three years, so we get to stay on air for another year. Oh, okay. I'm glad we have his blessing. You've been approved. His blessing or his permission? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, he's, he, he's our performance evaluator. Oh, okay. Good to know. Right? Yeah. Apparently, we did a good job, so there you go. All right. He's happy. <laughs> I'll see you. All right. Bye, everybody.